Hey folks, welcome to Narratives. Narratives is a podcast exploring the ways in which the world is better than in the past, the ways it is worse, and the paths towards a better, more definite vision of the future. I'm your host, Will Jarvis, and I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to this episode. I hope you enjoy it. You can find show notes, transcripts, and videos at narrativespodcast.com. Well, Jeff, how are you doing this morning? Doing pretty good. A little cold down here. It's kind of funny. Yeah, it's good. It keeps you awake. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's good. Uh, well, Jeff, thanks so much for taking the time uh, to come on the show. Do you mind giving us a brief bio and some of the big ideas you're interested in? For sure. Um, so my name is Jeff Huber. I live in San Francisco. Um, my day and somewhat night job is uh, running a sort of a fairly new startup called Chroma. Uh, we focus on AI tooling. Um, and then my my night night job, I guess, are some of the big ideas that I've been interested in for over a decade or more now. Um, it's sort of around like, I mean, one simple way to say it is like what comes after modernity. Uh, and I think like to frame that up a little bit, um, seeing uh, as many people have, right? It's not really a novel observation in some sense, but like, you know, seeing a lot of the like apparatuses and like beliefs uh, that were certainly true. And I was born and even growing up, like just fading away year over year. Um, and, you know, that leading to a lot of sort of weird and, uh, and sometimes violent manifestations. Uh, I'm kind of wondering like what comes next? Um, you know, like are we at a Fukuyamian end of history? Uh, is there, are there new good forms of government? Uh, do we just digress back into, you know, clans and, you know, more scorched earth, uh, zero sum war? Like what happens next? And or, of course it's the future. So, so nobody really knows. Um, but uh, maybe that's why it's the most fun thing to talk about because, uh, you know, nobody knows. So there's truly no experts, right? Like it's, right. Uh, it is, is truly anyone's best guess. And, uh, and that's the fun part. So I love that. I, I, I'm curious. I, w- I want to get started and, and first key in on something I've always been curious about. How do you think about defining pre-modernity, modernity, and then something like post-modernity? Totally. Um, so, so pre-modernity in my mind is, so one thing that I like to do is use this framework um, and define for any given time um, what do they believe about the nature of man, so mankind, the nature of the material universe, and then the nature of history or the meaning of history. Um, and so in pre-modernity, uh, you know, man was man was violent. You know, maybe sort of like a Hobbesian man, right? Um, uh, nature was enchanted. You know, there's sort of no, you know, we, we worship the rocks. We believe that you know, there's sort of like divine and spiritual forces that you know, run through all this stuff, the material stuff. And that like history was cyclical. Like, there was no dialectic or progress to history. It was yeah. just sort of like a who's in power this century, yeah, more or yeah. less. Like that was the, the framework, right? And then, um, you know, kind of my reading of what happened is really because of, you know, Judaism and then Christianity and then Christianity being spread through Rome and through the Roman Empire, um, it spread the ideas of, you know, man as uh, as rational. Um, it spread the idea of like the material world as knowable and studyable because there's a good God, and led to the idea that progress is possible because there's a, a dialectic, there's a meaning of history and a progression, you know, in the sacred text of Christianity. Um, and so, you know, those ideas secularized led to uh, liberalism and democracy as we see it today in the West. Uh, it led to uh, the scientific revolution because you can study nature and you can understand it. Um, and it led to the technological revolution because we can make new technologies that improve our lives and make them more abundant, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think that like post modernity, usually how it's defined is a skepticism of meta narratives. Uh, that's like one simple way to define post-modernity. And there's a bunch there, right? There's like your um, your Derrida's, your Foucault's, your Deleuze and Guattari's, like the whole crew of like French postmodern thinkers, the Frankfurt School. Um, and I don't actually think of them as after modernity. I think of them as hyper-modernity. Um, they actually took the skepticism that modernity had for meta-narratives, and they are the accelerationists of modernity fun- fundamentally. And so in that way, they are not 
uh, they're not representative in my mind of what comes after modernity. They are instead representative of you know sort of late modernity. They are like the end of modernity fundamentally. They are modernity sort of eating itself. Um, and I think I think it's you know kind of obvious that like uh, the nihilism that you know postmodernism generally brings is not really tenable or holdable by any human individual in practice. Right. And uh, and so, but uh, but still, it, it you know it represents this like hyper modernity in my mind. So. Got it. Got it. That makes sense. That makes sense. I'm curious. Uh, it seems really difficult to judge like the current moment from where, from if you're sitting in the current moment. If that makes yeah. sense. Uh, this is a really difficult question. But how do you think about parsing where we are currently, and is it just trying to compare it to the past as best you can? It's kind of it feels like you're almost looking at the side of an elephant, you know, and it's like. How can you tell it's an elephant if you're just right on top of it? It seems really difficult. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, fish don't know they swim, swim in water. Right. Like that kind of thing. Um, I, I agree it's challenging. That's not to say that it's impossible, and it's not to say that it shouldn't be attempted. Um, yeah. And very few people attempt it, to be fair. Right. Um, or people that do attempt it, I commonly find do a really bad job. So, <laughs> yeah. like, that's not to say that I'm doing a good job. I might also be doing a bad job. Uh, but, you know, I'd love, love to get that feedback. So, yeah. Um, yeah, there's sort of two questions, right? It's like how do we how do we evaluate the current moment, and then like what is the current moment? Right. So um, maybe to, to take the second one first, like what is the current moment? So I see that like essentially, the belief as you know man as rational has started to fall apart. I mean maybe you can point to like Dan Ariely's you know predictably rational, uh, you know the whole like behavioral economics movement yeah. um, as like hey actually people we don't actually believe in this, so we don't right. actually believe that man is rational, and then people are like oh yeah actually you're right we don't believe that you yeah. know and like um, Man is rational. Obviously, has a you know deeply intrinsic idea that as man is indiv- as individual as well. And, you know, increasingly, that's not a popular thing for like people to be individuals with in, you know sort of individual choices and individual rights. And right. it's sort of you know more about like mass collective identity. Yeah. Um. And so again, I think like it's hard to exactly point to like where and why and how this started. But um, I think that you know again the topic of of man and mankind and the and the um philosophy of that like um it's evident to me at least that people don't really believe that man is rational anymore another good example of this is like if you believe that man is rational then the best way to create a society is for make everybody extremely educated yeah. because like that would mean that people are smarter and then they can make better decisions collectively right. and make society better and yet like nobody actually believes in education anymore either like yeah. nobody nobody believes that like well lots of people disagree with my political my political points but if they're more educated it would be right. better like nobody yeah. actually thinks that like people just want to wield raw power as opposed right. to try to like convince through you know, rational arguments, uh, they're, they're sort of, you know, opponents or the, or the next generation. So, right. um, so that's on like, you know, the rationality point. Um, you know, I think with science, it's like, you know, uh, there's just so much, uh, fraud fundamentally that happens in acad- academic science, especially today, yeah. you know, you have P hacking left and right. You have people, uh, you know, having the research completed before they write the grant application because they need the grant application to work, right. uh, and to get more money. Um, uh, you have people just doing marginalia like over and over and yeah. over again. Um, in the social sciences, you have people just applying, you know, critical theory to X like yeah. one more time, and again, sort of making no real contribution to right. the future. Uh, and then in technology, you know, this sort of this is not you know unique to me, right? But there's sort of a, a general observation of like a slowdown of like technological progress and ambition, right? Um, and I think that also sort of like slots in here. So um, that would be sort of the obs- the observation of like what. How would we characterize? How would we even come to believe that potentially we're exiting this thing called modernity into after modernity? Is to look at well, what were the the values that we held during modernity, and then just look around you and I like ask your friends and like look at the right. media and the news and say like, well, do we you know is is it obvious in or evident or you know is it even apparent that in the world around me, you know people believe broadly that like man is rational, that the world is understandable, and that you know progress is possible. Right. And it seems like on all those vectors, the answer is no. Absolutely. Um, so that's one man's analysis, at least. I like it. I like it. Even this uh, effort we're part of this week, uh, AI grant, mm. it's quite interesting because it almost seems like, uh, it, it, to your point, it's something like, well, like, you know, thinking, the ability to reason, all these things, rationality is too difficult, so we're going to offload them to the computers. Mm. And they can take care of these things for us. Yeah, there's definitely a reading of AI as not a, uh, you know, deterministic, optimistic future, but kind of a indeterministic and you know maybe like pseudo pessimist pseudo optimist future um you know how does it get better we don't really know right uh, we just feed it more data and maybe it'll get better uh will it be good we don't know maybe yeah. it'll maybe it'll like you know alter us into gray goo and paper clips and yeah. the world will end or maybe we'll get like you know happy 
you know, perfect society at the end. Right, um, right, right. So, and I, you know, I don't guess the only framing of AI, but that's sort of, the, that is the pop cultural framing of AI. Yes. Is it is indeterministic and that it is uh, neither good nor bad. Um, sort of in like a, um, you know, the protagonist of many modern TV shows, right? There's right. no good or bad protagonist anymore. It's always complicated. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that's true about you know, AI too. It's complicated. Right, so. right, 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 right. Yeah. No, what, you make a, such a great point there. It's like a, we saw Sam Altman last night, you know, and it, it's this, uh, this vision of this like abundant future driven by, uh, you know, super intelligence. Mm. And then, uh, like you said, like right across the bay here in Berkeley, it, it's all about uh, the alignment problem. It's definitely going to kill us. Um, maybe this will peter down. They don't have these people don't have any money more, anymore, thanks to the yeah. FTX implosion. But uh, it, it does seem to be something like, wow, it, either it's just absolutely going to kill us, or it's absolutely going to be this like crazy abundant thing but it's like unknowable what's gonna happen and we just need to push to, to it as quickly as possible yeah i mean in general i think that a more positive view of the meaning of history um and this kind of dovetails a little bit into like ideas that i have about what healthy forms of these views could come in after modernity um is on progress specifically is being just less utopian about it all um it. and neither saying that ai will cure all ills in the world and make yeah. a perfect society and also neither saying that ai will end the world and will be the end of mankind. Right. Like both of these are very like, you know, either they're both very utopian or they're very dystopian. Yes. Um, and, you know, I sort of fundamentally believe that like only uh, one 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 being has the right to start or end history, um, and yeah. that being is God. And any attempt to play God is you know necessarily uh, blasphemy, basically. Yeah. And uh, the call of the you know the person in the world is not to end history or to start history. Um, the call of the person in the world is to like work at the margins to make the world, you know, a little bit better than they found it basically. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it kind of goes into the life extension thing as well. It's like, you know, should we make it so that, you know, humans can live forever, or, like upload themselves to the matrix or we like, you know, are able to replace all our organs forever and ever. Um, and like, I think that is essentially blasphemous, but I think that the idea in general of like, what well, we should make, give everybody five more quality adjusted life years is a good thing. So um, I think that also applies to basically sort of my views on AI, which is like, uh, neither will it be this like utopian thing that makes people perfect. Humans are not perfect. It's not going to be perfect. Yeah. Uh, uh, neither will it be this totally dystopian thing that like won't be able to be controlled and will take us all over. Um, you know, I think that it's, it's, uh, it's probably somewhere, somewhere in the middle. So, gotcha. and, and that's, and that's the most healthy thing to do is just sort of like, you know, again, view, view the marginal impact, um, and, and try to make progress at that margin. So, right. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, does this feed into why you're working on AI in the margin? You know, I haven't fully. I don't think I've like fully connected it yet. Yeah. Um, the yeah, the, the streams are are at least in my conscious brain, they're a little bit different. Though uh, maybe there's like some subconscious, uh, you know, psychoanalysis here, which uh, which does link them together. You know, I certainly think that like uh, the future uh, is open, that the future is possible. Uh, I believe that people do not believe in the future, do not care about the future. Uh, broadly, most people are extremely obsessed with litigating the sins of the past. Yeah. Um, that's really all I care about. Um, or maybe, you know, litigating the potential sins happening in the next month. Um, but nobody believes about the far future. Obviously, long term termism is very in vogue these days. Yes. Um, even though it's financing will maybe be a little, you know, a little more uh, meager in yeah, the next coming yes. next ne next coming year. But uh, again, I think that long termism is not a is not a new idea. And long termism goes back to uh, you know the individuals that worked. Uh, thousands of years ago to, you know, build, you know, large monuments across the surface of the earth, but including, you know, I, I often think of the, the cathedrals in Western Europe, you know, these like giant structures yeah. that take over a century to build, yeah. take tens of thousands of, you know, man hours, probably, you know, equivalently adjusted, you know, near a billion dollars to make. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, that takes some, you know, to work on something that like you cannot finish in your own lifetime, like ipso facto, I think uh, is a big deal. And obviously now you have things like the long the long now clock and stuff that I think are yeah. trying to create sort of a modern symbol of that. Um, but yeah, so sort of back to the, I guess, question and like, you know, does it, how, how does this interact with my, my, my day, my day to day work? Um, uh, yeah, I'm not exactly sure. I think that, you know, I do think that I guess, so I guess one other quick sidebar here is that I do think that like, and we actually talked about this last night, but you know, I think that fundamentally the two sort of primitives in the world are near free intelligence and near free energy, or sort of the two primitives are energy and intelligence and making those near free unlock new abilities for abundance in the world. Yeah. Um, and, and scale fundamentally. And obviously like, you know, power, I think that, um, 
there's a really good two by two uh, from this guy named Andy Crouch about um, about power, which I think is a useful framework. Yeah. Which is the two by two is uh, power and sort of you know, no power, lots of power, no v- vulnerability, uh, lots of vulnerability, and people only ever ana- ana- sort of analyze power along the dimension of like, well, we understand what no power and vulnerable looks like. That's like the homeless person on the street. Yeah. And we understand what uh, power and no vulnerability looks like. That's the dictator. Yeah. Um, but what is uh, power and vulnerability and like i mean from a christian perspective that's probably jesus um, or god yeah. and uh like both transcendent and imminent right yes and uh and yeah i think that's like un- it's underrated and people don't ever think about things in that term and so when you think about like technologies that could create a lot of power um obviously the individuals that steward them uh uh is really important but i think it's not it's not instantly you know, bad for the world, basically. Like, there can be good incarnations of it. And it's not up, you know, it won't naturally just happen that way. I don't think the cards will just fall that way. But I think it's, like, up for us, like, collectively to choose, you know, which way these things fall. And uh, we have to choose. Yeah. Do you, this, this is kind of a weird question, but do you think it is possible to kind of create a new definite vision of the future? So, you know, I, you know, Peter Thiel, he's always, like, hammering this, like, yeah. we need this, we need this, we need this. But then you ask him and he's like, I don't know. I don't know. And you're like, wow, you know, you're a lot smarter than I am. So I don't know how the heck we're yeah. supposed to figure this out. Right. Like, yeah. uh, do you think it's possible to do that at this point? Yeah. It's funny. It's funny. You bring up like, uh, you know, Peter, uh, you know, if you have one critique of Peter, it could be that, um, you know, that, that's, that's the best critique of Peter. You know, none of this other stuff that people write about him really is a good critique. I think <laughs> yeah. the best critique of him is like, uh, okay, where's, you know, where is it? Yeah. So what is it? Yeah. Like, and like, I don't know, you know, yeah. Like, uh, and maybe, you know, you know, maybe there's some sort of like you know generational aspect to this, right? Where he's like kind of like, okay, my job is to like you know be the signpost, not necessarily you know point the direction or whatever. But um, so do yeah, do we think it's possible? I mean, anything's possible. Uh, do I think it's probable uh, that it will gain global sort of scale? No. Uh, do I think that it's possible that it will gain? in some local communities scale yes um and i think that basically what you have to the turn you have to make to get to that definite uh that possibility of a definite version of the future is the the turn from late modernity to being open to what's next so you know it's, it's basically the turn from thinking that like this is the end of history to accepting that there's going to be new possibilities and new chapters um, and new forms of government and new forms of science and new forms yeah. of technology. Um, and that there's ways to do those things that are like new and different um, and new. I think also I, I want to be a little bit, I want to, want to put some context around new. I think that like new, obviously new in and of itself doesn't work because uh, newness is flighty uh, and newness doesn't guarantee that it'll resonate at scale. Right. So I think that it has to be, enriched and informed from history yeah and 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 it needs to whatever population you're talking to right needs to like almost like tap into their like psychosocial primitives to like be able to yeah. have traction and get scale and then i think also like newness is a uh, is, is in some ways overrated and that there's a lot of really good ideas in history that have been lost and ignored and uh i think probably to a large degree we can just like pick those up and repackage them and uh and that's good enough so gotcha. yeah new is maybe New is sort of a, I mean, new is, you know, sort of intrinsically a, a modern word, right? Like the idea of newness is inherently the sort of like, it's like coincident with like modernity. Right. Um, and so, but the idea of like these hybrids of like the past and the current and the moment and the future, I think is maybe more of like a, a after modernity framework for thinking about what is new. So anyways, that got a little like meta pretty quickly there, yeah. but it was fun. So absolutely. Absolutely. That, that's cool. How, how do you see Christianity uh, fitting into this whole puzzle piece? Yeah, I mean, I think in the West, like, I mean, Christianity is still, like, the water in which we swim. Um, you know, that's not to say that, like, you can, I don't think you can really make this argument by looking at, like, church attendance or, you know, polling or whatever else. Um, you know, more what I mean by that is, like, you know, the work that, like, Tom Holland has done in his book Dominion and other people have talked about it hasn't just been him, obviously. But the idea that, like, the values still, which, like, we as the West hold are intrinsically like christian basically yeah. so yeah i think it's the water in which we swim um it's still the culturally dominant thing 
um, even if I mean get one. There's some arguments that you know atheism is also Christian in some sense. Yeah. Uh, because it was only the belief that like nature could be de-enchanted, which led downstream to the idea that atheism yeah. is possible. But I, I'm sure atheists are going to hate that. So uh, please do not do not yes. DM me on Twitter um, about that. I, I will not argue with you. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, so I think it's really important. I think that like when I think about like, OK, what are the possibilities around like this definite optimism view, philosophy, theology, of the future? Um, it being looking for founts or sources of thought as i mentioned earlier these like sort of hidden lost ideas um in the past that have you know that that could particularly fall on like the rich fertile ground of where we are right now i think looking at christian history is a really good way to do it um so yeah a lot more to unpack there but that's the that's the overview what kinds of things do you think are useful to unpack from like christian history that that we do you have any specific examples that that come to mind yeah i mean on on the one kind of there's a bunch of vectors here one vector is the vector away from rationality as rationality as god at least so you know i still okay. think it's a good thing that people are generally rational when people are irrational it kind of gets under my skin yeah um you know i guess i get under my own skin pretty frequently for that you know for that reason um but um so yes it's not it's not that we want people to be more irrational it's that we don't view rationality as the end-all be-all um, as God, basically. And uh, I guess observationally, like that is one one way that you could observe this change is are people on the whole getting more mystical? Interesting. And to me, the answer is definitely yes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you've heard many people say that, you know, new atheism is cringe now. Like it wasn't 15 years ago. Yeah. All my friends are becoming more weirdly mystical in different ways burning man like yeah. it's huge now like i think to me it's self-evident i guess that like people there's almost like this new hippie movement yeah um which is is much more open to like i mean one way to say it is like other dimensional possibilities um yeah besides like the cold hard facts of rationality and atoms right it's interesting so is, is, we should lean into that more do you think this will be good well, it's going to be both good and bad. Yeah. Um, so I don't, yeah, I don't, I mean, you will both have probably, uh, you know, new, new Jonestowns, you know, like you'll have new crazy cults. Right. Like I do think that that's definitely going to happen. So that'll be the bad side. Um, but the good side is that, you know, one of the lies that I think the enlightenment and modernity said about mankind was that he was sort of this, you know, fundamentally gnostic bag of flesh right and not when i be my gnostic as i mean that uh he's primarily a thinking being yeah uh, and the body is sort of this like uh, sub you know subhuman necessity for like the brain to move around you know people joke right. about like this being true about i think it's like presbyterians or protestants where he's like you know it's like the brain yeah the body is just like a bag of flesh to move the brain around basically yeah. um and that's just a very like modern idea so and I think that's like basically just that's just not true about humanity. Like humans need transcendence. Like they need like mystical experiences. I right. Think that's just a very important part of being human. Um, some people call that obviously like religion, God, whatever. And so I think that in the sense that uh, being more open to this as a culture means that more people will explore this. It means that more people will be able to be more authentic to their humanity, which I think is broadly is broadly good. Gotcha. Um, and then there might be some like very specifically very very good flavors of it as well i guess beyond just like the generic the generic goodness but that makes sense that makes sense um how do you think about you know like how do you think about the, the, the this this problem where okay like we, we understand now that the scapegoat is innocent mm, yeah and uh this is bad you know, people still try to do it. You know, we're still trying to escape the scapegoaters or, or et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but, but, but how do you think about what comes, like, uh, you know, do you have any thoughts on what we do next with that? Mm. Yeah. So, you know, f- for the audience, maybe your audience is already quite familiar with yeah. Girard, uh, medic theory, et cetera. I do think that, like, basically that's one strong candidate for a view of mankind post-modernity after modernity is man as mimetic versus yeah. man as rational 
um, you know, the exact political implications of that I have not unpacked. Um, I do tend to think that the view of man as medic is sort of a post-liberal red, red pill um, in hiding. Um, and, uh, you know, post-liberalism has a, a bunch of crazy people in it. Uh, yeah. So that's like, I mean, yeah, that's again, that's sort of a trigger word in some ways. But um, yeah, so, you know, the idea of like what will happen to scapegoating, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I mean, Gerard would say that like scapegoating will become more and more prominent become, because it becomes less and less effective. So it's like the less effective that it becomes, the more that's unveiled, like the more that it has to try to like still concert, assert that it still works. And so the more extreme it gets. Yeah. Um, I don't actually know if that's evident to me that there's like a progression like that. Um, but I think another way to think about this is like uh, one thing that I would like to see and whether this is possible or not, whether this would be on net good or not is another question for sure. But I would like to see a world that is more, more local and less global simply because yeah. uh, global contagion is bad. Uh, and you know, global contagion, basically what will happen maybe eventually is that like we will have a truly globalized world um, and there will still be violence. And then, you know, a single person will come, come along uh, named the antichrist who will promise that he will restore peace and security to the, you know, the face of the earth, you know, sort of an exchange for our souls basically. Um, so this is like, the, again, this is the Christian view of the Antichrist. At yeah. least. And, um, you know, basically global, you know, just look at, you know, pick your quote unquote, the current thing, right? Yeah. Like it, it is increasingly becoming a global contagion. And I think that that is very dangerous, like extremely dangerous. And so in some sense, like if you believe that man is mimetic, you'd rather have a relocalization um, of communities simply to prevent the risks of global contagion. Gotcha. Um, and so there might still be scapegoating, um, but at least it would be at like the community level, which would just seem less bad than uh, scapegoating at uh, at the global level. Yeah, definitely less scale, less, you know, industrial methods of doing it, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. And also just like less, you know, these things won't necessarily line up community over community, right? Yeah. Like they'll, there'll be different variants of them. People will feel justified for different reasons. Like yeah. it won't be like, you know, it feels like today, uh, you know, and again, this is dangerous to say out loud, but you know, there's certain, let's just say there's like certain like political leaders in the world yeah. that like, it feels like if they got taken out for some reason, yeah. Uh, and it's like this is meta enough that like it can fit almost anybody, right? That if it got taken out, that like we would all be pure again. Gotcha. And the world would be the world would be good again, right? And we would all be like pure and good yeah. and clean and it's again. Yeah. And like the the blindness that would come from a world that felt all in one moment that they were purified, yeah, is terribly frightening. Right. Like this is a huge, huge <laughs> red flag. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, do you think uh, at some level people are overrating, you know, existential risks then? Because they like, you know, if you if you get obsessed with these things, they can become all consuming, and then you want to have some solution to fix it. And that looks like, yeah. I mean, the I think there's, you know, I guess what, the question is like, what is the right amount to care right, about exactly. tail that's, risk? That's, that's um, because never paying attention to it at all never taking it seriously at all is probably bad um taking it way too seriously and not being able to get out of bed in the morning because agi is going to turn us on to gray goo three years from now yeah is also bad um and but it kind of goes back to frankly this view of um of just sort of a broader idea of like you know is is progress possible do we like get out of bed in the morning and work hard to make it happen is it happening without us we should just yeah. let it happen or is it like all um yeah it's related to how hard we work basically to like try to try to try to address it so anyways back to your question about x risk like i mean i think it's 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 likely to be overrated by those i mean this is sort of a generic way to say it. it's a very generic point but it's like likely to be overrated by those that talk about it and it's like yeah. to be underrated by those that don't um makes sense and you know exactly what the correct amount of rating is is uh is anyone's guess but again on the margin because people that are obsessed about x risk could be a little bit less obsessed about it and people that are paid no attention to it could pay a little bit more attention to it yeah um the problem is that there's many x risks that um that are uh oftentimes overlapping and oftentimes at, at odds right and uh, they're also 
the unknown unknown X risks uh, that yes. you know nobody's paying attention to because they're unknowns. And so you know, and maybe there's some sort of uh, you know uh, I won't try to you know pick pick the analogy here, but you know, there's some sort of thing where it's like okay, if you focus entirely on AI risk, we uh, we miss the other risk, right? That uh, that truly is going to take us out or something, yes. something like that. So um, yeah, I think I think. I think again, like X, an obsession with X risk is just fundamentally like kind of almost a religious eschatology. It is a it is a narrative about the end of the world. Yes. The end of the world happens to really be helpful. You know, people having a, an immunitized eschatology happens to be extremely helpful for uh, giving you focus yeah, and motivation. giving you meaning. Yes. However, uh, you know, if there's a reason that people say like you should not immunitize the eschaton because uh, when you immunitize the eschaton, really bad things happen. It justifies a lot, right? right. When you think the eschaton is imminent and when you were working to immunitize it, uh, basically any violent act or any act of fraud uh, yes. <laughs> all of a sudden becomes totally fine. Right, right. And I think that's that's bad. Yep. Perhaps you take all your customers' money, put it on red, and then... Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't... <laughs> yeah, hypothetically. Hypothetically, yeah. that might happen. Yeah, yeah. That might happen. <laughs> <laughs> this is a bit of a tangent, but I'm curious if you have any thoughts on this. Uh, do you think there's something wrong with like uh, how a lot of people... Um, I've been thinking about expected value calculations, like like press is around mm. long termism or like uh, just in, in context of the FTX blow up. Um, it seems like perhaps you can get these things like brutally wrong or you underrate the, the the risks of doing these things or something like that. Yeah, I mean, obviously, expected value has in the word guess. Yes, basically. Yeah, I mean, guess expected is the same thing as guessed. Yeah, so. Um, you know, I have no problem with people. As long as people um, have skin in the game, right. I have no problem with them having making their own EV calculations. Basically, yeah. um, it's when it puts like society at risk, or it puts you know innocent people at risk, right? Um, or it the person who makes the bet is doesn't have skin in the game. Right, and that's like kind of the more bad versions of that. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously like there's a classic economist like all expected value is perfect because there's no twenty dollars lying on the ground. Yeah, um, and yet you have like private equity and hedge fund groups that have been extremely successful, like finding you know mispriced assets basically and yeah. like you know wh wh whipping them into shape. And yet the average trader still can't beat the market. So it's like kind of unclear. It's like is, yeah. any is anybody good at this? We want to say no, but some people have been like extremely successful. It's like does that just mean they've been lucky and their time you know their, their time hasn't come yet to be unlucky? Right. Um, so yeah, I think the broad idea is basically like, I'm totally fine with people like having their own expected value calculations as long as they like bear some of the downside. Makes sense. Makes sense. All right. Going off that, uh, like if I want to talk about efficient markets for a minute, um, no, clearly, uh, you're somewhat skeptical because you're working on a startup. And so, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you do believe it is possible to find these things. Uh, but at the same time, it does seem to be very difficult to beat the broad equity market. Um, uh, there, there's like some tension there. Uh, how do you think about finding twenty dollars bills on the sidewalk, and 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 how have you like uh, tried to systematize that? You know, when you when you're building uh, the new venture here. I mean, the idea that there's no twenty dollars bills lying around, the market is completely efficient. Yeah. I think is just intrinsically end of history. Got it. Like there's no arrived. yeah. There's there's nothing left to be done. Yeah. Which would be good or profitable. Yeah. And so we should just rent, seek, and chill. Yeah. <laughs> take a chill i love it which uh i'm not about that yeah so uh, and is not true empirically right like as uh, much as any study which has ever proven it to be true yeah so it's like kind of this like collective disillusion that for some reason it's like you know this sort of like mass contagion that we all believe this yes. or, or many people believe this yeah um when it's just like not true at all but yeah. i think it's it is coincident with again it is coincident with modernity it is very it is a very rational idea to believe the market could be efficient it's a very right. rational idea to believe that a more efficient market over time, uh, you know, will lead to more scientific and technological progress and all the good things. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it makes sense. When people, it makes sense when people believe it, like in context. But right. if you actually look at the facts, I feel like it doesn't make any sense at all. Makes sense. Makes sense. Um, I want to go back a little bit and talk about uh, localism, globalism, a couple of these different things. We, yeah. We're, we're sitting here in this this great uh, global city, you know, San Francisco. Um. But, you know, it seems like uh, localism is something you're quite interested in. 
how do you think about building community in in a in a place like this? Um, mm. is, is it uh, has it been difficult? Has it been pretty straightforward? How do you think about that? It's a good question. Um, yeah, I don't think about San Francisco as as a global city, actually. Um, nice. I mean. Maybe it's because of all the NIMBYs that are here, but it tends to be quite local <laughs> right? Um, and quite navel-gazing, for better or for worse. Um, I mean, San Francisco does feel like a small place once you've been here for a while, and I've been here for over 10 years. You know, you start to just, like, see people you know on the street randomly, and, yeah. like, you know, has it can, it can start to have a local community vibe. Yeah. That being said, like, you know, I've had many sets now of, like, best friends that have just, like, moved away. And, like, gotcha. you, know, you kind of get used to that. Um, and And... Obviously, because of, like, the internet, you can, you know, stay in touch with them. Right. And I do. Um, so, I think I, I have some sympathy for kind of the, like, whole, you know, Balaji network state, like, new right. communities will be digital yeah. primarily versus physical. Yeah. Um, I think that kind of makes, yeah, that that's underrated again. That's underrated. But uh, but physicality is probably still, under, still underrated. So, gotcha. um, as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know for now. Uh, you know, I have kind of this dream, and you know, maybe it'll be in the next ten years, or maybe it won't. But you know, I have this dream of like building, like this kind of monastic structure somewhere in like rural California, and it being a place where there's both like full time, almost you know, monks or nuns, or you can think of like other kind of variants of that, and that also has it's also explicitly set up for like groups of maybe like five to 10 families and their kids to come gotcha. and spend, you know, three to seven days in the same place together. That's cool. Um, and that being a tool that allows people to build some of these like deeper, closer community connections. And there's kind of nothing like that today. So like you could go, I'll go to Lake Tahoe and get Airbnbs next to each other. Yeah. But like, that's not the same thing because once your kids are asleep, you have to be in the same house as them. You can't right, hang out right. at night. Yeah. Or you can try to get like a giant house, but there's like very few of those and they're very expensive and they're yeah. not really designed. So I think it's like, there's like an under, this is like, this is again, this is one of my $20 I think is like laying on the ground and maybe not from like a profiteering perspective, but certainly from like a cultural impact perspective is having like more places or spaces that people at least can like get away to. Right. Um, I don't think that it's important that like every single day people be living like this necessarily. Yes. Um, but you know, the idea of like, you know, being a man of the town and then like, you know, retreating to the countryside yeah. uh is old as time right so right. um but there's not there's not yeah to, to build community in that way there's not really good tools right now so anyways kind of unrelated but that's one one idea that i've had i do like that i do i do quite like that that a lot um do you think uh physicality you know will become less important over time or have we re reached the local market you know, maximum with remote work, et cetera. And, and like the efforts that matter are kind of in vain to make these things more immersive to the point where it just, you know, the physical doesn't matter anymore. I think it's kind of interesting because I think in some ways the digital will matter more and more, but then maybe also the physical will matter more and more. Gotcha. So maybe like, I don't, it's almost like it's the opposition or the, you know, setting, setting them up as like this, sort of like, you know, setting them up as like opposed forces I think is, yeah. is, is what I would disagree with. And not, you know, so yeah. saying that, that's, that's yeah. your disagreement, sort of a false, a false duality. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that physicality will become, uh, again, like much more mystical, much more sacramental, gotcha. much more spiritual. Makes sense. On one vector. But at the same time, uh, you know, it's like, I think foolish to say that like VR will never be good enough for me to spend an hour a day in because I hate it and I don't like Mark Zuckerberg, you know, like right. that's just stupid. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe it's not worth a quarter trillion dollar investment, um, from one company, but, uh, but some, you know, entrepreneur that nobody knows about, or maybe hasn't even been, bo hasn't even been born yet. Like, yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. That um, makes sense. and I think that, uh, yeah, there's all kinds of, again, really bad things people use that for, but also really good things. So that's great. That's we'll great. See. Um, well, Jeff, uh, what do you think about the next ten years for yourself? What does it look like? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm pretty, I'm pretty focused on, um, you know, building this company right now. Um, I think it's really important to the future of 
let's say machine learning. Um, I still like the phrase that you know machine learning is done in Python and AI is done in Excel spreadsheets. Yeah. And for whatever reason, like AI is becoming like less taboo to say in recent yeah, yeah, times. Yeah. But I'm just gonna say machine learning. So yeah, um, yeah I think that the project that I'm working on, Chroma, is is really important to the future of machine learning. Uh, cool. Taking it, as we say, basically taking it from like alchemy today, yeah. which is like there's a few people that can figure out the right magical cocktail of ingredients to get yes. us to do something, and changing it into more of an engineering where uh, it's deterministic as possible to make progress, yeah. make the model better, get to results, be able to Definitely. trust it, make it yeah. al- make it aligned if you want to choose those words, make it safe if you want that word. Um, and yeah, we think that Chroma is is the way that that will happen, and we're building it in open source, and so it's like kind of going to be this community thing. Um, so that's a big that's a big emphasis. I think that over the next ten years we can we can get there. We can actually make that a reality. Um, so that's exciting. Um, yeah, I mean maybe we'll build that monastery in the next ten years. Uh, should should the, should the funds uh, should the funds emerge? Um, and uh, yeah, I mean I'm, I'm I think that like one thing that's been you know a lot of my intellectual sort of pursuits or efforts like are really done for my own sake, and they're done because I don't see anybody else. Like I take these things really seriously, and it seems like nobody else is thinking about it or caring about it, and so yeah. it's like, well, well, crap, someone has to. I guess, I guess I have to. Um, so, yeah, it still feels like there's certainly a lot to unpack. Like, if it is true that modernity is is fading away, and that it, it is yeah. true that there is a an open future of what comes after modernity, right? Then uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Yeah, and uh, you know, there's there's a lot of work to be done. You know, just purely in like formulating the ideas and building communities and like bring people into the fold and like, you know, for lack of a better word, evangelizing some of these ideas. And so, right. Um, yeah, I don't know what role is mine to play, um, in that. Um, if any, maybe I just, yeah, I don't know, but, um, but that would be, I think that would be, you know, I certainly still think it's like extremely important. So, definitely. um, as, as the opportunities rise, uh, yeah, I think in 10 years we can, I think in 10 years we can have some embryonic communities that are truly living day to day, week to week with some of the values that um, will define the next 50 years. It's sort of like how you imagine like the early hippie movement, yeah. you know, like there were, there were hippies before hippies, yes. you know, and, uh, and they were doing the commune thing and they right. were kind of like, they were, they were living out life and in a way that would become like a mass phenomena. Right. Um, and I think that um, something like that is going to happen again. It's not the hippie movement, but something different and new. Um, and that there, but it still will be germinated by small communities of people living in intentional ways. Yeah. And I think that like getting to that milestone in the next ten years is also possible. So definitely, those those would be two big projects. I love that. I love that. Um. Well, Jeff, thanks so much for taking the time today. Uh, where can people find you? Where should we send them? Yeah, my Twitter probably is the best place. Um, Good deal. So I'm at Jeffrey Huber on Twitter. Nice. And uh, I don't tweet that much, so I tweet like once per week. So I mean, I'm an easy, I'm a low commitment follow. Good I think. deal, good deal. I love that. <laughs> I'm not going to fill your feed. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm busy. Awesome. <laughs> That's great. Well, Jeff, thanks so much again. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been really wonderful. Awesome. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week with a new episode of Narratives. One quick note before I let y'all go. We didn't really get into it in this episode, but Jeff's company, Chroma, is doing some really cool work in open source AI, and they're hiring. If you want to learn more, visit their Twitter at TryChroma.